All right. Thanks for spending some time with me this afternoon. Uh, once again, my name is Scott Miller. I'm uh, going into my senior year at Montana State University in the computer engineering program. And this is my talk on repurposing an Iridium network satellite modem into a two-way balloon tracking and communication system. So a quick overview of the Montana Space Grant Consortium Borealis program, um, which both me and Tim uh, have participated in. It's an undergraduate program. Uh, it runs all year round, and uh, there is a summer internship period. And so my involvement uh, in this project actually was work I performed last summer during a 10-week internship uh, period. So the outline of my talk is I'm first going to talk a little bit about uh, the previous tracking system uh, that we use, some of the challenges um, that we uh, encountered with that. I'm going to talk about the satellite modem we selected, um, some of the configuration of the support systems for that uh, satellite modem, and then kind of show you what we came up with, um, some of the additional capabilities we're just starting to explore with the satellite modem, um, and then some final outcomes. So uh, especially after the last couple of talks, you guys probably are familiar with the, the amateur radio-based approach for tracking and communicating with uh, balloon systems, and we certainly uh, have used that, that type of system. We actually still do use those types of systems for uh, second and third backups. Um, so we, we actually still do fly amateur radio-based equipment, um, but we have moved on to the satellite-based system. Uh, we also did previously use DTMF decoding for um, things like flight termination. Um, and uh, we also use a spot satellite beacon. So those are like the little beacons that a um, hiker would take into the woods. And if they run into trouble, they can you know, hit the SOS button and send help. Um, but you can also configure those to uh, just send location updates uh, about every five minutes. And so our typical flights um, were burst flights, or cut down flights. Uh, obviously, Tim uh, talked about some of the additional work we've been doing lately. And uh, especially to that end, uh, we started moving towards this satellite-based system. And then previously, we did report launch location and uh, altitude as we went through different uh, regions of airspace. Um, so this is uh, kind of a look at our previous system. You notice a similar uh, ham radio. Um, and various other support equipment. Uh, I guess the reason I show this slide is I would call to your attention the, the only experiment really in this uh, payload box is the red box. And so you can see, you know, 75% of the, the payload was communications equipment. And so that was another reason we kind of wanted to move into a, a smaller system. And this is a, a picture of one of those spot um, emergency beacons if you've, uh, if you've never seen one. Um, and before I start talking about some of the limitations, I guess I'll show you uh, kind of a typical Montana recovery environment. And so uh, you'll see lots of hills, buttes, valleys, um, and then occasionally some less typical recovery environments. This was uh, a landing where we touched down on the other side of a mountain from the access road. The little blue line is our us walking to it. <laughs> So um, with that in mind, what we noticed is that as our payloads were descending, especially like maybe during the last 10 minutes of flight, we would lose line of sight um, via radio with our, with our payload. And so we'd stop getting our location reports. And so uh, we typically park our vehicles, do our launch, maybe go to a gas station, um, wait until we've actually landed, and then go um, try to find our, our payload. So it kind of became a... Um, you know, you lose it in the last 10 minutes, then you have to go drive over there, and hopefully you get, uh, um, you know, some radio packets coming in, or you had to wait for the spot location reports. Also provided a little bit less detailed reporting of our location uh, to the FAA than we wanted to. Um, and we also found that the DTMF system was kind of unreliable. Similar case, um, we would send a command to do something like cut down, and we didn't really have a way of knowing if that worked, um, per se, or if we were controlling a different uh, experiment. We didn't really know um, if those commands got through. Uh, and as I showed you, it's a, a very heavy and large system. Um, problems with the spot beacon itself, it only works up to 20,000 feet, and that's a limitation they place on it. So right about when we really start caring about you know airline safety and such, that system cuts out. Um, and also, if it lands upside down, let's say, you, you kind of lose that system as well. So now the, the satellite modem. Um, why a satellite modem? 
So once again, reporting to the FAA was kind of a, um, a hot issue. Uh, we wanted some kind of easy way to communicate to them where our balloon is. Um, they're interested in uh, distance from a VOR site like at an airport. And so that's hard to communicate, I guess, when you just have GPS coordinates or you just have an altitude. Um, and then we also ran into some issues with the online APRS uh, tracking sites. So there are sites out there that um, track your APRS packets and kind of plot it on like a Google map. But uh, we found that it's occasionally difficult to pull that information later so you can review it. Um, we also knew that some professional scientific uh, ballooning organizations, uh, such as Columbia Scientific, use this type of system. So we knew it was at least somewhat applicable to what we wanted to do. Um, and then kind of a, another nice thing, especially for a shorter 10-week internship period, the satellite modem has a GPS integrated into it. And so there's not um, additional work in interfacing with the GPS, um, trying to get that through your communication system and back to the ground. Um, so it gives us a little bit of a running start. So this is the guy we, uh, we picked up. It's an NAL Research 9602LP. Um, and so this is mainly marketed to the asset tracking industry. So if you were a heavy equipment operator in, let's say, Williston, and you wanted to know where your super expensive equipment was at any particular time, you'd probably have one of these on there somewhere. Um, it's a reference design from Iridium. It uses the Iridium constellation. It's just a global satellite constellation that you can send data through. Uh, it does have global coverage. Um, and then on the back, you'll notice a kind of a data port. We get uh, three TTL ports if you're an electrical engineer, and then two RS-232 ports out of that. And then we have our two antenna connectors, one for Iridium, one for GPS. And so it's very small. It's about the size of a deck of cards. Um, it's not very heavy, but it is built like a tank. Um, so some of the capabilities, if you were looking at something like this and you wanted to see what it could do, um, you can roughly send 300 bytes up or down from it. Um, and you can send about 100 of those per minute. So that's kind of your, your data rate. Um, power usage wise. It's relatively efficient, uh, 200 milliamp average transmit current. Um, and then you'll notice on the input voltage range, you've got this huge range to play with. So it's uh, easier for us to find like a hobby uh, solution for powering this or uh, an easy way to power this device. And then environmentally, it uh, certainly operates over the entire temperature range we would ever experience uh, in our flights. So at, after someone tells you about all this cool technology stuff, the you know, natural first question is, what's that going to cost me? And so uh, that's probably the biggest downside of this. So you have the modem, the antenna, and all the cables to connect it. Um, those run you about 1000 um, bucks. And then after you have all this cool stuff, you actually still have to pay to use it. Um, you have to pay $700 to Iridium to register. Um, you're actually registering a single computer that uh, is authorized to communicate with this system. Um, and then there's a $13 service fee um, each month, whether you use it or not. And then after that, finally, you pay by the byte sent. And so um, ignoring all the other prices, just looking at the byte price, um, we figure it's about $25 a flight, roughly. Um, so you can get an idea of how expensive that is. So you have this thing. Um, what do you need to do to, to use it? Um, so our take, I mean, there's many different ways you could use a system like this. Um, I think Iridium or NAL might even have like an integrated solution that you can just buy and it works uh, like a tracking website. But we wanted to create our own website with location data, um, once again, to report uh, where, where in the world this thing is, its altitude um, for us and for the FAA. And then um, you need to set up a main server. This is that server you register with Iridium. Um, it's registered by the IP address, I guess. Um, and that also has to receive the data from the modem and then do whatever you want to do with that data. Um, and then you also have the physical considerations like how are we going to mount this thing and how are we going to power it. So let's talk about some of all of that stuff. Uh, so our vision was to use Google Maps, um, just because it's kind of well known. People know how it works, um, know what it looks like. Um, and Google actually allows you as a student to register as a developer and give you access to what's called the Google Maps API. And that's just kind of like the back end you can use to interact with uh, Google Maps and kind of control it um, in any way you see fit. 
So um, on this computer that we're setting up, we decided to just use a computer in our lab. Um, you could use like a hosting company or um, maybe your campus has servers you can use. So on this computer, you need uh, an NAL service, so that's not just the, the money you're paying, but there's a um, computer program you run that interprets the data coming back down through the modem. Um, and then you need a web server to host your web page, to host your Google Maps site, um, a database to save all the information you're getting, um, and then whatever kind of code you need to do in the meantime, like converting um, meters to feet or something like that, your code has to handle all of that. So uh, you can do the web server and database in a lot of different ways as well. Um, we chose this all-in-one open source program uh, called XAMPP. And so what XAMPP does is it kind of bundles together all the things you would need um, to, to host a website like this. Um, and the XAMPP you can see broken out there um, on why they call it that. It runs on any of the popular platforms. Um, it's got your web server, uh, database, MySQL, um, PHP. Uh, the PHP server is kind of uh, what runs the server side code if you have anything going on in the background. And then Perl, which we don't use. Um, so the advantage for going with a program like this is um, usually the different versions and such of all these programs are made to work together. Um, there's still lots of setup, but uh, you're, you're kind of guaranteed a positive outcome uh, than just kind of hacking it together yourself. Um, so next was my homework. Um, I came into the internship knowing Java, I guess, at an undergraduate level um, fairly well, but uh, throughout the course of the project, I interacted with all of these uh, different technologies. So there was probably about a two-week period where I just did online tutorials and uh, went through example code and, you know, struggled to get this thing to work, um, which was kind of fun. But um, you do have to do some coding on the back end, which people may or may not enjoy. Uh, so this is the solution I ended up coming up with. Um, we have this folder that the NAL modem, um, when we get a GPS packet from it, it uh, uh, creates this XML file that contains all the data that's being sent down. And so I monitor a folder where those are dumped into. And then when I detect that a new packet is there, I grab all the information out of that XML um, file and put it in a database for later use. So that's just like, you can almost think of it as a, like a large Excel spreadsheet just filled with all your location data. And this is kind of what that looks like if you're interested. Um, the nice thing about XML is uh, from a programming standpoint, it's really easy to grab data out of it because you can say, like grab the number between lat slash lat. Um, and that's a lot easier for me anyways to, to parse out than some of the other ways you can do it. So what we ended up coming up with, you, you've kind of seen in Tim's, Tim's talk, um, when you first go to our website, you're just presented with a map of Montana. And so if you were then to turn on the modem, you actually get a little balloon icon um, that appears uh, wherever the modem is, and it zooms in and pans to that uh, particular location. And then for each new uh, location report, it'll move the map, leave a breadcrumb of where it's been, and you know resume, remove. And then down below, you can't really see it in this picture, um, but I'll show you in the next picture. It builds a, just a text table, so you can easily grab that information and throw it into Excel. So this is a, um, we have a previous flights kind of a system built in as well. Uh, this is what you would see like on a flight date though. Um, you get our little moving balloon guy. Um, you can tell down below, you know, what the current altitude is. It plots the most recent point uh, at the top. Um, and then one of the advantages of using uh, a database to store all the information is it kind of does some of the heavy lifting for you. Um, so for example, on this previous flights page, we actually don't have to edit this at all. It just does a query for unique flight dates. And then it just um, creates a, a table of all the different unique flight dates. And then you can click and get that information um, without having to maintain the code at all. Also wanted to make it uh, mobile friendly. Um, so when we're out in the field, typically we park at a gas station or something. We usually do have 4G internet access on our phones, but not Wi-Fi um, for our laptops. So wanted to make sure it would run on a cell phone. I had to slow down some of the processing in the background, um, plot fewer points and such. Otherwise, it'll really slow down your cell phone, but uh, it seems to work all right. And then this is the kind of final hardware layout we went with. So you're looking at the top of one of our command uh, capsules. 
And so the, the red bubble number one is the, the actual modem. And then you can see the uh, antenna cables going through the top. Um, two is our lithium polymer battery pack and a switching DC power supply that we built. We get very conservatively uh, 10 plus hours out of that um, of reporting. And then uh, what I'll talk to you about a little bit more um, in a few moments, number three is the um, uh, microcontroller we interface with the modem. And so, uh, for example, in Tim's talk, this is how we uh, open and close that, um, that vent and fire our uh, tethered dart and such. And four is how that uh, cable would connect up to um, the valve. So other than just tracking, what else can you do with this thing? Um, so we've already kind of talked about uh, the red dot there, Tim's um, event system. But uh, with the data outputs on that modem, you can really almost do anything you can think of as far as passing data back and forth. Um, one of our current plans that we're working on this summer is we have purchased a serial camera. And these are usually used in security systems, but uh, the cool thing about a serial camera is it takes a picture and then it breaks that up into little you know, bite-sized chunks. Um, and we're hoping to be able to send those back through. I think we've decided it'll take about uh, 40 seconds. Um, and a picture on the, on the right there, it's about 300 pixels by 240 pixels, would cost about $20. <laughs> But uh, it does give you an idea of uh, some of the interesting things you can do in flight. You know, we could check our orientation or we could aim some instrument or something like that. Um, so really, it's just kind of limited by what you can come up with to send through the modem. Uh, so outcomes, we've received very positive feedback from the FAA. So we do call them still um, and let them know when we're passing through the different uh, airspace uh, zones. But it's common for them to say, you know, oh, it looks like you guys are going to have a, a horrible, you know, hike in front of you or something, which is cool because it means they're actually looking at it and they're watching it. Um, and we've successfully flown it on nine flights. Um, four of those were our tests with uh, Tim's valve system. Um, and we've also found that it's, this thing's very durable. We've had, um, you know, parachute malfunctions and tangled parachutes and, you know, crash this into the ground at 70 miles an hour and uh, it still works great. Uh, you, you wouldn't even see a scratch on it. And uh, we've also found that even if you land with the antenna pointed at the ground, we can talk to it. Um, we can get data from it. So that's really cool. Um, as far as things we'd like to still do, um, we'd like to overlay um, one of these sectional flight maps onto the Google Maps uh, interface so that the FAA can see where, you know, our distance from one of those VR, VOR sites, which are these circles you see on the map below, because um, that's really what they're interested in. Um, and uh, you can do all kinds of data manipulation on the data you're receiving in a flight, like um, you could start um, plotting a, a descent profile where you think you're going to land if you terminated the flight right now. Um, so we have um, some folks working on that this summer. Um, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, so with that, I would open it up to any questions. So I'm going to follow you on this FAA issue. I know that if you choose to tell the FAA that you're going to do a flight, they will ask you for the range of bearing, VOR range of bearing. Mm -hmm. What made you think that you need to do that or they want you to do that as after, after launch? Yeah, I, think, uh, I, I don't think we're required to. I guess is the answer. I think it's just one of those things we like to do, you know, just to cover all the bases. Um, perhaps, uh, I don't know, Burke, if you can answer any of that. This is something that's evolved over the years uh, where the FAA actually contacted us and started to, to query us for additional information on the flights. And it's a relationship that is sort of mutually involved where we're very connected. I there, there are as many interpretations as to what's, you know, what people do. Mine was born out of a, out of a call. Um, we actually went a retrieval in the middle of a field with cows, and it was uh, flight services asking where the balloon was and uh, a recommendation to make a call to a number. It was all very polite, very professional, but it's just it's something that has evolved in our program. So um, we 
the days of, of just going out and launching a balloon and, and having a lot of fun are sort of over for me. Uh, <clears throat> I, I file mission notices four or five days in advance of any flight. So I know all the guys have been great. I think, I think it's been good for our program. So you use Irid Iridium to, to track, and you can use it to, to, to bring a picture back. Right. Um, have, you, have you used it for even things like temperature, pressure? Not yet. Um, actually, as this uh, serial camera project um, uh, progresses, um, right now we're controlling that Arduino um, with the TTL outputs, which if you're not an electrical engineer, you can just think of them as the three on-off switches. <laughs> So you can either use those three to turn three things on and off, or you can interpret it as a binary code. So it'd be two to three or eight different choices. And so that's how we're using the Arduino right now. Um, it just looks for the different combination of three bits um, and then makes a decision. But to do this serial camera project, we actually have to start using the RS-232 port on the modem. And with that, you can configure any setting. You can change any setting you'd want um, using like a terminal emulation on like, let's say a Raspberry Pi. Um, so you can send whatever you want. Um, you, you basically tell the modem, hey, I'm about to fill up your buffer. You fill up the buffer, and then you send the, this AT command to, to send what's in the buffer. And so you could put whatever you'd want in that buffer. Um, you would, on the ground side, have to then decode that. Um, but it, it's there. We haven't done that yet, and we're still working on it. So the $25 per, per flight is for the GPS? Yep, location data, and then... It would just cost more if you had more. Right, yep. Yep, right now we're just using it mainly. I guess I didn't explain how we actually send commands to this. Um, so currently, we, um, y you can craft this special email to Iridium, and in the subject line, you put, like, your serial number, um, and then you attach this encoded binary file with whatever you want it to do. And so then we send that email. We get a, um, a reply back that says, hey, that's queued up to go to your modem. Um, and then uh, it, it does, you know, our Arduino interprets that. If you do the RS-232, um, you have much more <coughs> control over what the modem is actually doing. What's the time lag on that email? So um, Tim showed that video of us doing the, the vent on the deck. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a cool situation where even if you can get this working outside your lab door, you know it's going to work because it still had to go through the whole system. Uh, we found that it takes maybe 10 seconds from email sent to valve open, um, roughly. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Well, you know, you said it's going to work, but where do you put your antenna on it? Because if you um, don't have that antenna pointed to a satellite, it's not going to get through, and you may not know that. Yeah. Actually, one of our uh, first discoveries was if you place a GoPro right in front of your antenna, it doesn't work very well. And so um, there's definitely some considerations there as far as what you, you know, what you place where. Um, w after removing our GoPro, we haven't had those types of uh, problems, but certainly you, you do have to worry about, you know, some kind of spurious, you know, electromagnetic stuff that's happening in your box close to that antenna. Um, yeah, just for a heads up, we have these systems on an aircraft and they were fine except when we turn and when you're in big thunderstorms sometimes. So, you know, they need to be pointed upwards and they don't always work. So. We've actually had pretty good luck with that. Um, this was our last flight last week. Um, we actually, the yellow box is our command capsule and that landed with the Iridium modem literally touching the ground, uh, the, the antenna pointing down. And we were still able to both send and receive from it uh, in that position. And so um, burst events, when you get the, the tumbling, I mean, we still get data while that's happening. Um, so I think we're cautiously optimistic that that's not going to happen. Um, we'll bridge that <laughs> if we have to.